After capital had taken centuries in extending the working day to its normal maximum limit, and then beyond to this limit of the natural day of 12 hours, there followed on the birth of machinism and modern industry in the last third of the 18th century, a violent enroachment like that of an avalanche in its intensity and extent. All bounds of morals and nature, age and sex, day and night were broken down. Even the ideas of day and night, of rustic simplicity in the old statutes, became so confused that an English judge, as late as 1860, needed a quite Talmudic sagacity to explain judicially what was day and what was night. Capital celebrated its orgies. In this long section, Marx has again taken an historical look at the struggle over the working day and analysing the position of the working class being first on the defensive against capital and then their shift into being on the offensive. As soon as the working class, stunned at first by the noise and turmoil of the new system of production, recovered in some measure its senses, its resistance began, and first in the native land of machinism, in England. In the early 1800s, factory conditions were awful due to many of the circumstances and situations the working class faced, which I previously talked about in the previous videos. Due to some political agitation, there were some labour laws passed, but they weren't really enforced. In 1833, however, the first Factory Act was passed that set maximum limits of the working day to around 15 hours for some industries. It also set age limits for child labour and set limits to the amount of hours a child could be employed for. Capitalists responded to this by finding new ways to lengthen the working hours, mainly the development of the relay system I mentioned previously, but also found new ways around the law. While children couldn't be employed for more than eight hours a day in one factory, nothing stopped the capitalists from making them work at two separate factories. Often both of these factories would be owned by the same person. With growing working class agitation, in 1844, another factory act was passed that protected women workers over the age of 18 limiting their hours to 12 a day and banning night work. Children under 13 got maximum limits set to six and a half hours in some industries, and there were some standardizations of meal times and official work finishing times. A further Factory Act in 1847 reduced the hours for people between the ages of 13 to 18 and all women to 10 hours a day. There was, however, still no regulation for adult male workers. Capitalists again responded to these laws by repealing the Corn Laws, which in effect lowered wages by around 25%. In 1848, revolution spread across most of Europe. In England, however, capitalists in response to this threat restored night labour for adult males and reorganised the relay system. Many workers were kept in factories longer than their hours and they attempted to remove the factory inspection reports. In 1850, the Court of the Exchequer ruled the Factory Acts of 1844 and 47 as meaningless, in effect abolishing the previous victories of the working class for their reduced working hours. But on this apparently decisive victory of capital followed at once a revulsion. The work people had hitherto offered a passive, although inflexible and unremitting resistance. They now protested in Lancashire and Yorkshire in threatening meetings. The pretended 10 hours act was the simple humbug. Parliamentary cheating had never existed. The factory inspectors urgently warned the government that the antagonisms of classes had arrived at an incredible tension. The working class struggle now went on the offensive. People organized all over the country and through 1850 to 1863, further laws and factory acts were passed that reduced the working day for all to 12 hours including adult males. The relay system was ended, as working hours were limited between 6am and 6pm across most industries. A standardised meal time of one and a half hours was introduced, and many regulations that made working conditions safer inside the factories were won by the working class. It will be easily understood that after the factory magnates had resigned themselves 
and become reconciled to the inevitable, the power of resistance of capital gradually weakened, whilst at the same time, the power of attack of the working class grew. The creation of a normal working day is, therefore, the product of a protracted civil war, more or less dissembled between the capitalist class and the working class. In this short final section of chapter 10, Marx reaches a conclusion from the previous sections after a small analysis and makes an international declaration. The passion of capital for an unlimited and reckless extension of the working day is first gratified in the industry's earliest revolutionized. The first fact that Marx states is that due to the working class struggles we saw, the factory legislation was imposed within some of the main branches of large scale industry. With continued effort from the working class, it was gradually extended to all industries. The history of the regulation of the working day in certain branches of production and the struggle still going on in others in regards to this regulation prove conclusively that the isolated labourer, the labourer as free vendor of his labour power, when capitalist production has once attained a certain stage, succumbs without any power of resistance. Secondly, while this has been successful in large-scale industries, the isolated workers in smaller workplaces and in different areas are left vulnerable to the horrors of capitalism. The February Revolution was necessary to bring into the world the 12 Hours Law, Marx points out that while in England it took many, many years for the struggle to limit the working hours, and not for everyone, the 1848 revolution in France, however, granted the French working class limits to their working hours instantly and for all places of work. Labour cannot emancipate itself in the white skin, where in the black it is branded. In the United States, the struggle of the slaves in the South were crucial to the struggle of the wage labour in the North. Working class are all connected by our relationship to capital, regardless of the colour of our skin. Some sections of the working class cannot fight for their own freedom if others are used as slaves. After the American Civil War, the working class gained strength, and agitation for an eight-hour workday began in America. The limitations of the working day is a preliminary condition without which all further attempts at improvement and emancipation must prove abortive. The Congress proposes eight hours as the legal limit of the working day. Marx himself participated in the International Working Men's Association, or the IWA, often called the First International, which was an international organisation which aimed at uniting a variety of different left-wing socialist, communist and anarchist groups and trade unions, that were based on the working class struggle and class politics. Marx here points out that the IWA calls for all members of the working class around the world to come together as one and demand a universal eight hour workday. It must be acknowledged that our labourer comes out of the process of production other than he entered. In the market, he stood as an owner of the commodity, labour power, face to face with other owners of commodities dealer against dealer. The contract which he sold to the capitalist, his labour power proved, so to say in black and white, that he disposed of himself freely. The bargain concluded, it is discovered that he was no free agent, that the time for which he is free to sell his labour power is the time for which he is forced to sell it, that in fact the vampire will not lose its hold on him so long as there is a muscle, a nerve, a drop of blood to be exploited for protection against the serpent of their agonies, the labourers must put their heads together and, as a class, compel the passing of a law, an all-powerful social barrier that shall prevent the very workers from selling, by voluntary contract with capital, themselves and their families into slavery and death. In place of the pompous catalogue of the inalienable rights of man comes the modest Magna Carta of a legally limited working day, which shall make clear when the time which the worker sells is ended and when his own begins.